Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm an applications engineer here at Easy Power. And on our Thursday webinars, we frequently invite industry experts on different topics to share information pertinent to the general topic of electrical safety and electrical power system analysis. And as usual, before I introduce our guest speaker for today, we'd like to start off with some poll questions to get a little bit of a feel for the audience perspective and uh, also kind of forewarn you of where we're going with this discussion. So uh, there's no obligation, but certainly if you would please uh, participate, it would give us some uh, ability to kind of direct the conversation or tailor the conversation to the needs of the audience. So the qu first question, do you or does your client have a documented electrical safety program? I was telling Terry that I'm really looking forward to his presentation today because I think this area of documentation is really underemphasized. And at the same time, we may be preaching to the choir. So it's anybody's guess how we're going to end up here. So we get I'll save this about another 10 seconds. We're close to a quorum. We appreciate you joining us today. It looks like we're there. Here's how people have weighed in on this first question. So it looks like, uh, like I say, we may be preaching to the choir. So that's good to know. The second question is, are you aware of, or do you have a documented job safety plan? And you're aware that it's available or necessary before doing energized work? This is not a trick question, <laughs> but some of us may be in the, uh, in the weeds on this one. So I apologize if it was a little too obvious. But again, uh, we spend more time talking about the analysis and the phenomena, which is the electrocution and arc flash. We uh, don't spend enough time talking about the documentation. So it looks like we have a quorum here. Here's how folks weighed in pretty heavily on, on the correct answer, if you will. And uh, third question, are you familiar with the document IEEE 1584.1 guide. And I admit that I refer to this document frequently, but I don't spend that much time detailing the contents. We're talking about easy power tools. But as I'm sure Terry's going to emphasize, it's uh, extremely valuable in terms of guidance for doing a study. Thank you for participating. So here's how folks have weighed in on this one. And I didn't include it on my main slide, but I have one other question because it was, it's a, um, it's a fascinating topic, and Terry's going to be talking about more details on it. But have you, and I misspelled escape, have you seen the escape strap now available on some PPE? And at times like this, we're glad we have someone like Terry who keeps his finger on the pulse of advancements in the industry. So yeah, I was I was in the same boat here. Appreciate you participating in, and attending today. Here's how folks, most of us hadn't heard of this, so you'll be excited to see uh, Terry's information. So again, our guest speaker today is a returning presenter for the Easy Power uh, webinar. And we look forward to uh, his presentation. He's a thought leader in the industry. And with that, let me hand the presentation over to Mr. Terry Becker. Give me just a second here. Terry, you have the podium. Jim, thanks a lot. And uh, again, um, appreciate, um, just gonna show my screen, there we go. So thanks, Jim. And again, I'm really uh, glad to be here again and uh, present uh, in one of the Easy Power webinar series. So. As Jim alluded to, we had some poll questions here that uh, you'll see how this plays out in my presentation. Some interesting responses. Um, I'm not surprised. So we're going to talk about implementing NFPA 70E uh, slash CSA Z462 energized electrical job workflow. And before I start, just a disclaimer that I usually provide. Um, what you're going to hear today is um, my interpretation of 70E and Z462, and I'm disclaiming that and advising you that if you want official interpretation of 70E, 
contact NFPA and official interpretation of Z462, please contact the CSA group. So just that brief disclaimer. What I want to talk today to you is a brief introduction to frame this topic of energized electrical job workflow. Specifically, it's truly the application of Article 110 in NFPA 70E and Clause 4.1 in CSA Z462, which is general requirements for electrical safety related work practices. And then I've sort of added on the end the electrical safety program requirement. And ultimately, this electrical safety program that 70 and Z462 advise employers uh, should be mandatory is how I'm going to frame this electrical, energized electrical job workflow. So field implementation is where we need to take all of this. The, the arc flash hazard incident analysis calculations, the labels, ultimately that's out there and on the electrical equipment for the qualified person to be successful. So how do we take 70E and Z462 and their core requirements and, and get it out there into the field and really I'm going to talk about this energized electrical job workflow concept and how it aligns with 70E and Z462. Ultimately, the arc flash risk assessment again, uh, one component of the two risk assessments that the qualified person has to complete, and then link that back to 1584 again and 1584.1, uh, as Jim uh, mentioned in the poll. And I, I still find, and when we get there, that 1584.1 is not, engineers doing the study in Canada and US don't know that that document exists. And it's an amazing supplement to 1584. And I'll talk about that in a little bit later on. And then evolution and arc flash PP and selection and some of the cool things that again, engineers doing the study should know about this. They, you, you know, you're promoting PP probably to your client and giving more information on, on what's evolving out there adds value to you uh, when you're doing the calculations. And if we do have some, you know, employers um, and owners of electrical equipment on the webinar today, some additional information for you. Conclusion and then questions. So introduction the way i framed this from the beginning is it's about the worker this qualified person they get jobs assigned to them they've got to go do that job they've got to solve the problem in a maintenance role the discussion related to commissioning systems is still the same they've got to go commission the motor control center so ultimately it's jobs are assigned to these qualified persons and then there's discrete energized work tasks and it's it's really that discrete energized work task or multiple tasks to complete the job where the worker is exposed to arc flash and shock. And then the definition for working on it's very high level in 70 and Z462, diagnostics and troubleshooting or repair and alteration. But you need to get a little more granular on a discrete work task underneath that working on definition. Z462 and 70E provide prescriptive mandatory direction for an employer, for an employer related to this topic. And I think that that's still missed. You know, I think the training that's out there, it's for the qualified person, but ultimately the, the maintenance manager, the uh, electrical instrumentation supervisor, or the other task qualified worker supervisor, they need to understand more about what 70 and Z462 are prescribing from a documentation perspective. And that will be discussed today in this energized electrical job workflow because the documentation is missed, right? It, and, I, and I'm, I'm asked, well, what do you mean documentation? Well, look to 70E and Z462, and it provides some prescriptive documentation, specifically the energized electrical work permit, and that a job safety plan shall be documented. So again, how do we frame this for the worker so they can be successful, they can apply the training, and they can move to electrical safety competency? All right, so jobs are assigned to workers planned or reactive breakdown work in a maintenance role. All right, and, and how again do they then become successful in applying their training ultimately to eliminate exposure or reduce their risk to as low as reasonably practicable? All right, so documented policies, practice, procedure requirements need to be in an employer's electrical safety program. Well, not need, shall be, if you, again you look to 7DE and Z462, it's prescribed. And ultimately, this is what will give the employer defendable due diligence. OSHA regulations in the US and OHS regulations in Canada. So this program, you know, and I've seen several different electrical safety programs, actually more than several. And yes, you can you can frame your program differently, but I just keep coming back to 70 and Z462 and say, well, ultimately, these are work task based standards. So it's it's about job workflow, energized electrical job workflow, discrete work tasks, and then what does 70 E and Z462 prescribe? So jobs are assigned. The beauty of 70E after that topic of jobs assigned is there's work task tables embedded in 70E. 
right? Table 130.5C and 70E and Table 2 and Z462. There's 31 work tasks. And again, there's tools in 70E and Z462 that the employer adapts into their electrical safety program. And then again, we're implementing these key or mandatory requirements. The job safety plan has to be documented. The shock risk assessment has to be documented. The arc flash risk assessment has to be documented. And we want the worker to then apply these additional protective measures, the boundaries and the arc flash and shock PP, right? And other risk control methods so that when they do that, this at-risk work, again, we've either eliminated exposure or they, the qualified person, has personally reduced their risk of exposure to as low as reasonably practicable. Got a little plan, do, check, act graphic on the top right of the slides. You'll see that in the slides as we go throughout. And I'm going to get to that. That's, an, a, a, that's the philosophy that I've promoted for a decade, is plan what you're doing, do it, check it, right, and then act on the findings. So that's a consistent philosophy in this whole discussion. In fact, here's the more detailed graphic for that on this slide. All right, so we've got this regulatory oversight for regulations, and ultimately we got to have a plan, and it should really be an occupational health and safety management system with this supporting electrical safety program that 70E and Z462 mandate. Plan, do, check, act, all right? Then we implement that plan, right? This program is developed, it's rolled out, but it needs field documentation. This energized electrical job workflow is a way to communicate that concept ultimately to the worker in the field. And then we need some documentation filled out because ultimately the supervisor should check. The supervisor needs to check. And this is also in 70 and Z462, the element of audit and field checking, field auditing by the supervisor. A documented job safety plan will allow the supervisor to do that. And it's a key component of this energized electrical job workflow. And if the workers aren't filling out the documentation correctly, then you work with them and coach them and get them to understand why the document is important to them and that they fill it out, they take the time. All right, so again, 70 and Z462, mandatory requirements. Now, here's some slides with those mandatory requirements. And again, Article 110 or Clause 41 in Z462. Priority and policy must be documented in the electrical safety program using a procedural requirement, establish an electrically safe work condition. That's the first priority. But then we have justification for energized work documented. The program is again mandatory and it works with the overall occupational health and safety management system. And then we need safe installations and we need inspection of those installations, National Electrical Code or C Code Part 1 with proved electrical equipment. And there's some other key requirements in the NEC related to Arc Flash specifically that aren't in the C Code Part 1. So that's your starting position and your electrical safety program should indicate that you're going to comply with those requirements. Well, that's also related to risk. Then condition of maintenance, again, this is NFPA 70B and CSA Z463 and ANSI NIDA MTS, also needs to be identified in your electrical safety program, and that impacts risk again with respect to life of occurrence. The program should have principles and controls and procedures. Then specifically, there has to be a risk assessment procedure, and I've got a 3 by 3 risk matrix for electrical hazards and the flow chart that's actually in Annex F of 70E and Z462 about how and what a risk assessment procedure is, and it's six steps, six things you need to do in the risk assessment. Now, this energized electrical job workflow is dependent on all of this information being documented in the employer's electrical safety program, and in this case, the discrete work tasks the worker's gonna perform, right, that they're risked by an electrical safety committee that the employer has in place. This risk assessment procedure, the outcome is the hierarchy of risk control methods that you see in this graphic, top down. And we need top down risk control methods, not bottom up. The employer should not be buying our flash PP first and sending the workers on training and getting the studies and labels installed. It should be talking about how can we eliminate exposure and yes, ultimately doing the risk assessment procedure to identify the appropriate PP to identify training as a need, you can see it's in the controls as item five. And then the studies, arc flash hazard incident analysis studies and equipment labels, that provides the arc flash hazard information for the workers so that when they're implementing the synergized electrical job workflow, they get the label. The label is the best method to get the arc flash and shock hazard information in front of the worker on the electrical equipment before they work on it. And then they use that to document their job safety plan. All right. So 
some focus on normal equipment condition related to risk. This is all part of the risk assessment procedure. So all of these mandatory requirements are in Article 110 or Clause 41, and all of this will feed into the energized electrical job workflow, procedural workflow that the qualified person will then be implementing to be successful in the field. So this graphic is more of an overarching, you know, why are we doing all of this and how does it all work? So we've got the oh regulations, general duty clause, identify all hazards, eliminate or implement controls to reduce risk. So hazard ID and risk assessment on the left, hierarchy of risk control methods on the right. The occupational health and safety management system and ultimately the electrical safety program underneath it, the plan, do, check, act philosophy on the bottom left, and then standards. 70E, Z462, and for the calculations for 28 volt to 15 kV three phase, IEEE 1584, and this 1584.1 supplemental guide that I really encourage you purchase and have available to identify a quality study and a quality report. So more about the mandatory requirements. So this job safety planning and job briefing, it's a, it's it, you shall have that. So when I talk about this, I point right to the standards. We'll tell you, well, what do you mean documentation? It's in the standard. These are all mandatory requirements. Incident investigations, lockout tagout program, auditing, right? That's the need for the documentation. How can a supervisor audit if there's nothing to audit? They can do observations, that's one form of auditing, but ultimately they can't be there all the time and they won't be. So documentation, this documented job safety plan will be how and one method that again, the employer, uh, specifically the supervisor can audit. Now. That was actually emphasized in the 2021 edition of 70E and in Z462 by including example job safety planning forms in the annexes. All right, so check it out. If, if you haven't looked at it yet, there's examples of job safety planning forms that can be used for the qualified person to document their job safety plan. All right, so training, uh, qualified person, emergency response training, emergency release of a shocked worker, host and contractor employer requirements, test instruments, portable cord and plug connected electrical equipment and GFCI. So those are a quick summary of the mandatory requirements of 70E and Z462 and Article 110 and Clause 401. So field implementation, this energized job workflow. So my opinion, and this is how I frame it, this is how the electrical safety program should operate around the fact that we've got to have this management system, appendices, forms, flow charts, infographics, that are delivered to the qualified person so they can implement this job workflow in the field. And as I said, be very successful in either eliminating or reducing their personal risk to as low as reasonably practicable. All right. So jobs assigned, planned or reactive, the discrete work tasks, table 130.5C in 70E, table 2 in Z462, 31 work tasks, but take this information out, massage it, change the work task descriptions, make your own table, and, and customize it, delete work tasks your company doesn't perform. That's how you use the tools in 70E and Z462. All right, so it's procedural energized electrical job workflow. On the screen on the right, you see this example of this workflow. So down the, the mainstream, the core are 13 steps. And then left and right are some push outs on other things that I just said 70E and Z462 prescribes that are required to be addressed or resources for this qualified person to be successful. So develop the program. It's a toolbox for field implementation framed around energized electrical job workflow, procedural steps in this workflow. Apply this workflow against your occupational health and safety management system requirements. A field level hazard assessment is required first to identify all hazards. For larger industrials, they may have a separate safe work permit, separate from what we would call the energized electrical work permit in 70E or Z462. But this needs to be customized around how ultimately jobs are given in, I'll say it, work order execution, right, by the maintenance qualified person, all right? Apply the 70E Z462 requirements, the laundry list that I just went through. It's a serial process and repetitive. And there's other tools, again, that we want to give this qualified person information, like I said, task tables that they can look up the tasks and, and identify what they, they need to do, what risk control methods they may need to apply, well, not may need, that they shall apply. And ultimately that job safety planning form is where they write it all down before they start to do the at-risk work. 
All right, and ultimately we'll get electrical safety competency because that this, this paperwork, this form will help them apply the training effectively. So the arc flash risk assessment and the role of 1584 and 1584.1, again, it's arc flash hazard information for the qualified person when they're executing that energized electrical job workflow in the field. This is the best method to give them this information. We also have the arc flash PP category method. If there's no calculations completed, that can also be used. And we could apply a label with the arc flash PP category number on it and the arc flash boundary and working distance from the arc flash PP category tables. All right, so again, bridging this to the calculations, ultimately that's what you're delivering. <clears throat> so 1584, it says calculate the incident energy at a working distance and the arc flash boundary. And then you provide example arc flash and shock labels in your report. These are compliant labels. So I continue to try to influence the implementation or the recommendation of compliant labels to ANSI Z535. And again, so that the worker can get the information they need. They understand where the incident energy is on the electrical equipment, it's quite clear to them. <clears throat> There's a lot of arc flash labels that have been provided over the last 10 years that are not compliant. So we need to continue to influence what this compliant arc flash and shock label is. The 40 cal myth again, I still see that in studies when I review them for clients. There is no 40 cal stop point for energized electrical work. It is not dangerous and <clears throat> PP actually exists up to 140 calories per centimeter squared arc thermal performance value. So I continue to bring up the 40 cal myth that we need to get that off the table and it shouldn't be in a documented report by a PNG or a PE at all, right? And the risk assessment procedure that I mentioned earlier is the employer's responsibility, not the engineer doing this technical study and these technical calculations, all right? So quality analysis and quality report, IEEE 1584.1. If you do not know about this, you're hearing it today, buy it. The 2013 edition, 2013, seven years, eight years this has been available. It's currently being updated, all right? So one thing I didn't mention is I'm a voting member on IEEE 1584, and uh, we're working on a new version of this. It's hopefully gonna be published this fall. But by the 2013, we're just touching up the 2013 version to correlate to the 2018 edition of 1584. So quality study and quality report recommendations in 1584.1 please buy it. Even if you're an employer and listening to this and you're an electrical engineer or supervisor, right, buy this and then you have guidance on how to request in an RFP a compliant study and a compliant report. So evolution of arc flash and shock PP and selection, right? So <clears throat> Jim alluded that I, I bring this in my presentations. It's important to understand what's going on here and, and, and it's still not out there. There's still not an awareness of all the good things that are happening to arc flash PPE. So the outcome of the arc flash and shock risk assessments are the selection of PPE by the qualified person. The evolution improvements, again, some of these have been around for years, still not known. Some of them are fairly new, all right? The escape strap option, all right? So true color gray lens technology, it is unbelievable. And the <clears throat> picture you see on the screen is the green tint on the left, the new true color gray that's available from multiple manufacturers of arc flash suit hoods and arc graded face shields. So night and day, right, forgive the pun, and then the LED on the, on the, on the right-hand side, it also makes it night and day. So it should be mandatory that the employer specifies true color gray lens technology and LED lamps on face shields or hoods. This impacts positively likelihood of occurrence of the worker making a mistake and creating an abnormal arcing fault and arc flash. This is the cool thing Jim mentioned, the escape strap. So again, this whole thing about rescuing right, and, and being the first responder and how do I safely rescue. If there's a second worker, right, an electrical safety watch, this is a vest that you see on the right, and on the, on the left, it's integrated into the arc flash suit jacket. This came out last year, all right, and I'm telling you, this is, this is amazing stuff. We don't need the rescue hot stick anymore if we have this escape strap. So the vest goes over top of an everyday wear coverall or shirt, and then the arc flash suit jacket, well, that would be integrated into the arc flash suit jacket, all right? And then that length can be extended to that strap, right? And so you could have the electrical safety watch holding on to this. If things go wrong, they can move back. And as they're moving back, they're pulling the primary worker back with them away from the electrical equipment. Cool stuff, right? Just out last year. Now, arc flash PPE works. I've been lucky enough to get 
to both Kinetrix with Oberon and Kima with Bulwark. And this is Bulwark at Kima in Pennsylvania. And what you see on the screen is the test apparatus on the left and on the right, the outcome. That's a pass. You see this carbonization right of the shield and of the, of the actual arc rated garment. It works. It works. We just need to get the workers to wear it and wear it religiously when they're exposed. So I'm going to show a video. And again, this video, if it'll play, no, well, maybe it won't play. Sorry. Again, I'm just going to, doesn't look up. There we go. Um, this is actually the test. I'm just going to play it. Eight, two, one. Eight, two, one. So that's pretty horrendous. When you see an arc flash in, in, in person, yeah, it's, it's quite the event. But that would have been probably less than 10 calories per centimeter squared. And ultimately, now what you see in front of you is the actual mannequin. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, that plasma cloud's a, a wave. It doesn't bend. So you can see the back of the shirt is new. The front took the arc flash. And you see that blackening, that carbonization. Now, what's going on here is Scott Marjano with Tyndale's pointing to multiple clothing worn underneath. So arc flash PP works, but we've got to get natural fiber clothing worn underneath. So again, here's the pictures. Here's the evidence. I was there. I witnessed it. So again, all of this, again, these studies, following the energized electrical job workflow is to get the worker to wear this arc flash PP when they're exposed and it works and we need to tell them that it works. The results, yeah, it looks horrendous, but the burn injury is a 50% probability of the onset of a secondary burn injury to them when they're exposed at the ATPV of the clothing they're wearing. Now, this is the Kinetrix lab. Again, I've been lucky to get there. The control room on the right, really cool stuff, you know, engineering stuff, but the lab in the middle and the test apparatus, and the test apparatus you see in the front is how they test the rectangular swatches of fabric following ASTM F1959 to establish an ATPV for that single layer or a multi-layer system that would be fabricated in arc flash suit using those single layers. Now, again, I was there. I had this arc-rated face shield from Oberon, and I, I thank you for allowing them to come there when they're there. And we arc flashed it. So you see it new on the left, arc flashed, and the LED was still working. I was blown away. Forgive the pun. I'm going, wow. And that's performance. You see that blackening, that carbonization, and the melting of the shield? So this is what the shield will look like after you take the carbonization off. It melts to take the heat, and then there is some deflection of it. But again, it's designed so that only enough heat comes through to the worker's face for the 50% probability of the onset of a secondary burn injury. All right, so again, this is the other side of it. This stuff works. And again, I've been lucky. And, and I, again, it's a luxury that I've been able to see this so I can talk to it. Now, this is the actual arc flash of that shield at the Kinetrix lab. So that was probably at 20 cal because the shield's rated to 17 cals per centimeter squared ATPV. And sometimes when I show these videos, I have to temper them that at the labs, they've got to play around with the fault current and the time to get the incident energy. You know the calculations. So sometimes the arc flash you see aren't what we would expect in the field. They, they won't be sustained that long, right? So I just temper that. Now what you see on the screen are two arc flash suit hoods. And these are 140 calorie per centimeter squared ATP hoods that are Oberon's. And again, I was lucky to see there to witness this because what was being tested was the true color gray lens technology to make sure that it passed. All right, so we create an arc in between with the electrodes, two, two hoods opposite of each other. And then the instant energy is going to obviously wave out the plasma cloud to those hoods. And on the right, what you see, it looks, it looks pretty horrific. But that's what happens is the, the outer layer of a multi-layered system, a total system arc rating achieved for the arc flash shoot, it blazes like that. It's meant to do that. And then underneath you see the yellow, which is the next layer. Now that I don't know how many layers, because I'm I didn't ask and it's proprietary probably to the manufacturers, but probably six, seven, eight, nine layers to get to 140 cals ATPV. But that's a pass. All right. Again, it blazes like that. It's meant to. And then the shield, the lens shield, you can see it carbonizes. And if you wire brush that off, again, what you'll see is you'll see the shield like this, right? Okay, so 
this stuff works. And again, the calculations, the labels, they give the worker the information, but we want them to be successful. This concept of this energized electrical job workflow that, that is a way to communicate to the qualified person, again, how to use the training, how to use that workflow to tell them when they need to document their job safety plan. And again, there's now a form, like I said, an example form in 70E and in Z462. And ultimately, all of that should be under the employer's electrical safety program. Now, this is a very cool thing, too, that relates to ArcFlash. I just found out about this product last week. It is brand new. It's a Canadian product. It's called Extender Rack. So if you're doing the calculations, working distance, right? Default working distance in 1584, 18 inches for low voltage, 24 for low voltage switch gear, 36 inches for high voltage switch gear and MCCs. Now, this is a 17-foot telescoping hot stick adapted into a racking tool. So again, this whole concept of get the worker further away and eliminate exposure, this is a brand new example of this. There's still innovation coming to this topic. It's still coming. And here's an example. This I didn't know about this till last week. <laughs> and again, you can sense a lot of, at times, passion and excitement in my voice because I'm trying to find solutions and communicate how we can use these solutions in the field. But ultimately, all of this feeds to this qualified person and they need to implement it in their energized electrical job workflow in the field. They apply the training, they apply arc flash and shock PP tools and equipment that we deliver them, the employer delivers them. And then we have a study with the labels and we need that study to IEEE 1584 2018 to be rationalized and reasonable and practical in the parameter selection, which again, I've been involved in reviewing the reports and I'm very temperament about we need to be reasonable as electrical engineers when we, when we set up the calculations, right? So another cool innovation on this side of it, extending, and this is not new, this has been discussed about for a decade. And you'd find that, that you know, they, the employer might feel retrofit, weld up an extension. Right, but now we've got a product by a vendor, and I have not seen this anywhere in North America until last week. So some cool stuff. And innovation in electrical safety, the true color gray lens technology, the escape strap, right? And now this extendable racking tool, right? Again, the other challenge with the employer is money and budget. <laughs> so if we can have different options, and then the employer has, again, budget-wise, the ability to select like a, a complete remote racking robot system, which is quite expensive. And now we can have something that's a lower cost to get that working distance. Right now, this is obviously limited because there's only so far you could go extending the distance of this racking tool. All right. It's just, it's got limitations, right? Where it just probably they've decided that limitation when they developed this product. All right. So there's some cool stuff coming still out there. All right. So, I moved very fast today because I wanted to open up the floor. So just to, to bring things to conclusion, NFPA 70E and Z462 are prescriptive standards. They're standards. They have prescriptive requirements in them. And I mentioned earlier the electrical safety program is a mandatory requirement. And I don't know why companies don't have programs because 70E right in Article 110 says the employer shall document, develop, implement an electrical safety program as a component of their overall occupational health and safety management system. So 70E and Z462 right away, that's the first thing they say. And in the 2021 editions, the cleanup and the reorg in Article 110 and Clause 4.1 really reframes that very well. That the employer has to have a documented policy or documented prioritization. And then establishing an electrically safe work condition needs to be documented as a procedural requirement and then we need justified energized work and the energized electrical work permit can be used but it should be by exception and there are exemptions to that permit then we get to that risk assessment procedure and again that's a job risk assessment procedure a, a matrix should be used a qualitative risk assessment and then underneath that we'll give the controls to the worker and they can implement them following an energized electrical job safety plan right Energized electrical job workflow, right, is how they can and then how the program can be positioned to deliver this to the worker and they follow that workflow. So, again, 
1584 and 1584.1, very important standards. 28 volt three phase to 15 kV, other formulas for greater than 15 kV. And 1584.1, I cannot emphasize enough, it's just not known. If you don't have it, buy it, you're gonna go, this is amazing, <laughs> because it backs up your study. It gives you the proof to your client that you're following 1584, but 1584 gives you the formulas. 1584.1 tells you how to methodically do this very specific power system study. Short circuit analysis, protection and coordination, then instant energy analysis. And there's more to it than that, parameter selection. And 1584 says, here's what you might wanna put in your report. So you can do QAQC on your study and on your report. So 1584.1, look it up if you don't have a copy, buy it online. It's actually cheaper than 1584 itself, all right? And then the arc flash PP evolution, positive contribution to like of occurrence, right? That's the change here for the arc flash PP with the true color gray lens technology, is the worker can see their work better. They're less likely to make an error when they're doing energized work. The escape strap, cool stuff. If things go wrong now, how can we rescue, right? How can we get this worker away from the electrical equipment without imposing the hazards or getting the, 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 the rescue or the first responder to, to not be exposed to the potential hazards that are still there, right? So that's cool innovation. And then increasing the working distance with that extender rack tool, some really cool stuff, all right? So I'm gonna bring things to a close today. I told Jim I'd be a lot more disciplined, maybe a, a little quicker in my presentation style so that we can open up for Q&A. I'll take any Q&A that anybody wants to ask or offer and uh, can be here for the remainder of the time that we have. And again, Jim, I, again, I did go fairly quick. So if there's even something that someone wants me to review or discuss in more detail with a question, I'd be more than glad to do that right now. Good. Well, yeah, we've had a couple of questions come in as you've been talking. Uh, one of the first is uh, uh, Zaid is asking or saying that these slides appear to apply to a specific voltage level or do they apply to all voltage levels? All voltage levels. So 70E and Z462, low and high voltage electrical equipment, right? So low and high voltage definitions, US, 1,000 volts or less or low, 1,001 volts or higher. In Canada, we have actually just moved in our latest edition of the CECO part one to the same voltage levels for defining low and high voltage. So 70 EZ462 apply to enclosed electrical equipment uh, up to 35 kV or higher these days. Um, so again, jobs and work tasks performed on that electrical equipment. And, and the way I frame it is it's, it's the job first, then the work task, then the worker needs to identify the maximum voltage of exposure for the work task they're gonna perform on the electrical equipment. The electrical equipment is actually the last consideration, right, to defining the arc flash and shock hazards. It's job, the work task, the work task then is the qualified person exposed to arc flash and or shock, one or the other or both. In most cases, they're exposed to both when they open up that hinge door or they remove that bolt on cover and then go in. And there's more to it, there's, there's more we could discuss and it's probably another, another ongoing webinar about the discussion of the difference between diagnostics and troubleshooting, repair or alteration, isolation related work tasks and operation of that said electrical equipment. There's a lot of, I guess, misinterpretation again about related to those four descriptions of working on is when is the worker exposed to arc flash specifically? So this question kind of dovetails with what you just said. Eduardo's asking, what happens to the arc flash boundary when the job is at the back of the panel or the back of the MCC? So I guess I'm gonna have to interpret what you mean by the back. So if you have front and back access, right? And you have a label on that motor control center that says the working distance is 18 inches, it doesn't matter whether you're on the back or the front of the electrical equipment. If you're opening it up, and doing one of those discrete work tasks in table 130.5C for 70E or table two for Z462, right? It's still, again, work task, then the working distance that the worker needs to maintain to their face and torso when they do the work task. The incident energy defines the arc flash PP that they need and the arc flash boundary then is a distance that's applied. Now the arc flash boundary I think is misunderstood as well. 
The arc flash boundary is really a boundary to keep unqualified, unprotected workers out away when the qualified person is inside that boundary and doing the work task that ca could cause the abnormal arcing fault and the arc flash. All right, so the way I frame that, and I didn't have this in my slides, is, is really the, the arc flash boundary is a safe zone. It's a safe zone where you don't need any PPE, right? So the working distance is this at-risk distance here for the workers facing torso, but they've got arc flash PPE on because they did their arc flash risk assessment and defined additional protective measures, which was determining the PPE from the equipment label, right? If we have the studies completed on the electrical equipment. I know that's a long-winded explanation, but this is really how 70E and Z462 work against these calculations. And it's the employer's responsibility to define these policies, practices, and procedural requirements in their electrical safety program for that qualified person to have as a toolbox. So this question pertains to the 40 calorie reference. Virel says, is it not dangerous and above 40 calories due to physical injury and not burns? How does the definition of danger change? So, so what's happened in, and Jim and I have talked about this over the years, right? Um, that the arc blast pressure was unfortunately wrongly interpreted um, there was some notes in 70 and Z462 and the original tech committee back then, they, they, they arrived at 40 cals, but it wasn't substantiated. Those notes were deleted two or three editions ago because arc blast pressure is based on arcing fault current. It has no direct correlation to incident energy. And that was originally identified by Dr. Ralph Lee, who I'm proud to say is a Edmonton, Alberta PhD electrical engineer in the late 1980s and early 1990s that first did right, research, empirical calculations, right, to define incident energy at a distance and the arc blast pressure, right? So if you look to his papers and the old yellow book, which is now the IEEE 3007.1, and 3, a document, his graph shows up in the old yellow book, which is now 3007.1, and 3, and it shows you that blast pressure correlates to incident energy sorry, blast pressure correlates to arcing fault current and has no direct correlation in energy. So 40 cals is not dangerous. And it, again, forgive me for being critical of the software, but the software defaulted and put that into the results table and was a decision-making tool that then put it into the results table, but wasn't substantiated by the engineer in their report to the client. And then when, when, the, when the label said no PP exists, well, arc flash suits, with an ATPV of 140 have existed for 20 years. And when you do the risk assessment that I mentioned, and you do a qualitative risk assessment with a risk assessment matrix and a process, you will also, in that risk assessment, clearly identify that 40 calories is not dangerous, it's not high risk, because we have PP available up to 140 cal ATPV that works the same as an 8.7 calorie coverall, 50% probability of the onset of a secondary burn injury if the workers arc flashed at the ATPV. Plus, there's no documented evidence of any fatal injuries due to arc blast pressure in incident statistic reports. And there's one available that the NFPA authored that is public domain, can be sent to you if you want it, if you're not aware of it we can follow up on that offline. So there's no statistics to prove it. There's no statistics to prove that any molten metal has caused any type of injury whatsoever to a worker. So it's a, what I call a myth, a myth and a misinformation that's propagated. So I keep mentioning that. So we get this dialogue going that 40 calories is not a stop point and should not be communicated in a PE or PNG issued report to the client, right? The client actually decides what is dangerous right? Not the engineer doing the calculations. Okay, so here's another question. What's the difference between DC and AC PPE? There is no difference. So for DC arc flash, the results are the same, a calculated incident energy, right? So the DC formulas that are in easy power, the results are the same. There's a defined working distance, you'll calculate incident energy, and it's the incident energy value that's on the label that the worker uses to determine the arc thermal performance value of arc flash PP, right? So the formulas are different, DC versus AC, but the results are the same. An incident energy that the worker then uses following that energized electrical job workflow that I mentioned today, 
to determine what PP they need. They produce, check and inspect it, don it, do the at-risk work, whether it's DC or AC. At that point, it doesn't matter. All right. Is, here's one from Anthony. Is taking a voltage measurement in an energized 480 volt motor control center considered hot work? And then a corollary is troubleshooting on a 480 volt equipment considered hot work. So again, I'll start by the the, worst, the, the use of the term hot work. Hot work is related to hazardous locations work. So again, 70E and Z462 have an energized electrical work permit. So the first thing is we want to call it an energized electrical work permit. And working energized is not hot work. Again, that's a hazardous location issue. And then the energized electrical work permit is not required uh, for doing uh, diagnostics or troubleshooting work. It's exempted because of justification. Due to equipment design, we need to be able to open it up or take a bolt on cover off and go in and find voltage and, and confirm the actual voltage expected is there, right, first of all. And if that motor starter, the motor's not running, we need this qualified person to be able to open up that door and then check both the power right and the control circuitry right so that's a bit of a long-winded explanation but it's twofold and it sort of was two questions asked so it's not hot work it's energized work and that energized work can be performed it's justified we just need the arc flash and shock risk assessment completed and we need it documented in that job safety planning form that i mentioned right and then follow that job workflow concept as we move through that that process for the qualified person to be successful in applying their arc flash training so Long-winded answer, but I hope it answered the questions that were posed. Yes, that sounded like it. Here's one from Zaid. If we design a system based on 1584, 2018, then a new standard is introduced. Should all studies have been updated and the labels replaced? I think he's talking about starting with the old standard, and then what do we do if the new standard's out? So what I provide as advice is similar to 70 and Z462. When new editions of 70 and Z462 are published, the previous editions are no longer valid. So IEEE 1584 published in 2002, it had some supplements that were issued, one or two, I think. But then the new version of 70, sorry, 1584 published in November, 2018. So technically all new calculations performed after that date should be to the 2018 edition. But the employer, the owner of the electrical equipment, right? So if you're a consultant, the owner ultimately decides when they would move to doing their studies or redoing their studies. And then I, I recommend that the best way to do it, because it's a huge cost and, and there's just not an unlimited budget here, is if I was the employer, the owner, I would do a risk assessment and decide on where I need to prioritize spending the money first. And there'd be some rules that I would apply to do that, that, that determination. Where is all the energized electrical work occurring? At facility one, two, or three? Well, facility one's our, our biggest facility. That's where we do most of our work. So then that's where we'll maybe budget. And then the other thing I want to comment is the new formulas, right? Between the VCB and the new VCBB box electro configuration, Right, you're going to find the results are going to be very similar to the 2002 formulas. So there's the other thing too is based on what I own, do I have high, low and high voltage switch gear and high voltage MCCs? Do I have any electrical equipment that would have an HCB box electrode configuration? Because then that's where I'd want to prioritize doing the calculations. As an owner, and I was an owner, I worked for a large oil and gas company as an electrical engineer. I couldn't just go to management and say, give me money right? I had to do a justification and the justification had to be sound and credible or else they'd throw it out the door. So you can't just blindly say we need to redo all of our studies. It won't fly with management, right? You've got to do a risk assessment. And to, to electrical engineers, th this tool is powerful. If your company doesn't have this business risk assessment matrix, then come up with your own risk assessment matrix and process. Use that as a tool within your company to go to your management and say, here's where we need to do our studies starting with this facility, then this facility, those can wait. And then we'll get there and then we can budget over a multi-year project to update the 100 studies for the 100 facilities we have. That's a credible solution to upgrading and doing your studies. 70E and Z462 say every five years, you should review your studies. And if things have changed in the power system, then update your study or the portion of the study that's impacted. 
what we've had happen is new formulas came out. But like I said, it doesn't discredit your existing calculations because the results for VCB and VCBB in the new formulas will be relatively the same, if not slightly lower for VCB. So you really just have to do this risk assessment to prioritize what studies to budget for and then schedule to update the calculations. Uh, here's a question about PPE. Any idea about the weight of the full suit and shield, face shield, that's suitable for 140 calorie exposure? Right. So when you look at these hoods, all right, so this is an example of a 75 cal hood that I'm assuming everyone can see my camera still on. This is very lightweight. So if I'm holding this up and you can see it's very thin, the layering technology now for all of the art flash suit vendors has evolved. So the total ounce weight of the multiple layers of fabric is very light now. So the total ounce weight of this hood or the jacket or the bib overalls is, is unbelievably lightweight now. So employers should upgrade 10 year old art flash suits to the new art flash suit technology because it is very light to wear. This has this true color gray lens technology on it and an LED, right? So this is unbelievably comfortable now compared to what it would have been even five years ago. Again, multiple arc flash suit vendors have lightweight multi-layered options. Employers need to budget for it and upgrade for multiple reasons. Comfort, this true color gray lens technology, the LED, and then hood ventilation systems. Because I find that the man, you didn't buy the hood ventilation system, right? So this hood ventilation system, right? blows fresh air to the front of the hood, right, and gives oxygen to the worker, defogs the lens, increases their comfort when they're wearing this fully encumbering arc flash suit hood. So this stuff has evolved unbelievably in the last five years, right? So very comfortable now. The qualified person has no reason to complain wearing this, none whatsoever, right? But it's a cultural behavior issue that should be part of you know, the electrical safety program being deployed and trained to the workers is to deal with that. But there should be budget to upgrade the arc flash PP. Another thing to budget besides up budgeting to update the studies. Terry, thank you very much. It looks like that's the end of the questions. I did want to announce that Terry's provided a copy, a PDF copy of his slides, and they will be uh, linked on the Easy Power website when we post the video. So thank you again for attending, Terry. A very good job. Thank you very much. Jim, again, I just want to thank Easy Power and you personally for, for allowing me to present in your, in your, in your webinar series. I'll, honestly, I commend you and Easy Power for, for allowing me to talk about this side of it, right? And again, I hope again that everybody got something out of this today. And uh, take care of yourselves out there. And thanks a lot, Jim. So long.